This is James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes, and say, here's a good seat for you, or say to the poor man, you stand here there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mar mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of God. Sticking to that phrase at the very end of the scripture, mercy triumphs over judgment. In the last <clears throat> month, the Lord's been speaking to me. I always hate, I always hate to say that, because if I say that, it's sort of like I hear heaven voices from heaven or I'm extra special or something. But you walk with Jesus, don't you? Day by day. You, you, you know that he guides you here and there. I think he speaks to you. Uh, early, early this month, it was joyful for me. It just seemed like the Lord reminded me of all the good things he'd done for me. How, how his hand has been on my life. How... Uh, accidents that I could have had but didn't have. Uh, scenes like that come back to mind. Skipping along the road in New York, wet and the cars totally out of control. In New York, where the cars bumper to bumper and never even got a scratch. You know, does the Lord watch over us idiots? You know. So many times I cry, I've told you before, I call upon him, don't let me fall, and I haven't fallen. How he delivered me, answered my prayers, blessed me with a wonderful wife, I'll brag. God gave me a wonderful wife. My family's been such a supportive and good family. And we've had our scandals, of course. Still turned out pretty wonderful. And I'm just got thinking all day, day after day, to do Twitters of joy go through my heart as I can remember. The Spirit was reminding me of how good my life has been. But this week, it shifted gears. 
This week is reminding me of how I've disappointed you. Something that I've done, opportunity that I had to really be a blessing, and I wasn't. Is in this area of having mercy and judgment upon people that are poor. Now, when I say poor, uh, there's various ways of taking that word. We all think we're poor if we're not millionaires, right? <laughs> but the kind of poor uh, that I'm talking about was in the Bowery in Boston, in, in the, what they called Scully Square. When I was in college, my goodness, this is way back in 1954. <laughs> One of our assignments was to go down to the rescue missions and preach the gospel and share the love of God. And when I say poor, I didn't know what poor was till I got there. But growing up, there were poor people around us. Uh, I, I, did, I don't want to be <laughs> discriminatory here, but uh, in New Hampshire, there were a lot of people who had, French people who had moved down from Quebec to get jobs in the woods, cutting pulp. And generally, they were quite poor. But boy, they were respectable, you know. Uh, we, we, us good old New Englanders who've been there for a thousand years, we talk about the French as almost like a different world or something. But they'd always end up saying, but they're some clean, ain't they? You know, they were respectable. They kept their word, they worked hard, and they were poor, but you could accept them. Always. But the kind of poor that I was faced with in Scully Square is uh, dirty and stink. And they'd call us in to preach and I'd tell them about the love of Jesus. And, uh, and in my heart I was saying, if you guys would just give your hearts to Jesus and quit doing drugs and being a bunch of winos, you get your act back together. You're, I wasn't saying this out loud, but in my subconscious, that you, if you hadn't been so dumb and rebellious, lazy, you wouldn't be in this hell hole. That was, of course, I never said that. That just those were just sort of the emotions that I had. I'm sure you've seen a few people like that. A few years ago, my brother and I went to North Carolina to a conference. He picked me up. We drove to Washington, D.C., and in the, in the not so nice part of Washington, D.C., there was uh, people living under the overpasses in uh, cardboard boxes and plastic tents and tents and uh, every time you come to a stop sign these people would run right up to your car and start washing your windshield and I always felt half scared <laughs> you know and they wanted to change you didn't ask them to do it they just rushed up and do it they wanted to change and uh, there again, I felt emotions of fear and revulsion and impatience and disgust. It was sort of a let me out of here. Because greeting people that far away from me in their culture, in their experience, immediately a judgment goes on inside me. I feel almost, I hate to say out, out loud, I just feel disgusted. You, should, you, you don't have to be like this sort of feeling. 
I know nothing about them. I don't know where they came from, what kind of pains they suffered, if they are traumatized. I know nothing about them, only that you're a mess. You've, you've, God gave you a life and you're thrown in a way, that, 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 that kind of feeling, that kind of judgment. Right? If I could, I'd help a fellow. I think I told you before, Wanda, who, my daughter Wanda lives in Montreal, and she only, about two months ago, got a, got a good job, so she was living hand to mouth for quite a while. But she said, I was kept two toonies, two loonies, actually, loonies, in my pocket on the way to work, or the, or what job she did have, and uh, <clears throat> because they were beggars. And I took, but after a while, I just didn't have them. So I bought a few oranges, you know. So she'd have a little bag of oranges, and someone would come and ask her, and she'd give them an orange. And she said she gave a, a lady an orange, and the lady just looked at her, disgusted and cursed, and threw it. And immediately, Wanda told me that I judged that woman. See? That judgment came right in there quick. She only wanted the money for drugs or something, you know. That's the thought that came to my mind. That kind of people are hard to minister to, you know. I, I've had opportunities, but it's hard. And I think God is disappointed in my response. The people that James was writing to in this epistle were Christian Jews <coughs> who had been driven out of their homeland in Jerusalem throughout all of Asia. But a few years had passed and they were getting settled in and they were smart people and they were skilled and they had their little markets and their jobs and they wanted to relate and be, be relevant to the society in which they lived. And they formed little churches, little family groups that worshiped together and they all have what we now call the agape meal. They get together and have the bread and the wine and their prayers and share the gospel. And uh, because there was food available uh, and the doors were open, people would come. Some people who didn't know about Jesus. And uh, nice people would come with golden rings. And wine always would come, I suppose. Poor people in ragged clothes. Now, when you're trying to be a church, you like to attract people, but you like to attract prestigious people. It's nice to, to be moving upward. It's true, just think about it. Whenever a great movie star is converted and makes big headlines in the Christian papers, you know, some great athlete speaks for Jesus, everybody listens which if you think about it, doesn't really make much sense. Why would athletes know even as much about Jesus as a fisherman or a farmer, you know? But they're famous and they're prestigious and they're rich and it would be so nice to get a lot of them added to the church or give the church a rosy appearance. James urges us to refrain from valuing one above another based on their economic or social standing. People who do church among the homeless meet desperate people who are amazing in their courage and faith and kindness and salvation. They're dirty and ragged and uncouth, but they're reaching out, still being a light in dark places. Every city that I know anything about, even the small city of Halifax, has enormous numbers of homeless people. You may remember, I don't know how long ago, just a few years ago, uh, Tom Waits had a, had a hit on, on a radio song where this man was singing over and over again. He was a, a
homeless man, this, this is a true, true event, the homeless man in London, England. And I, I listened and listened and listened, looked it up on, on Google this week just to get the history of it. This, this sounds like a, a wino, just, just this old croaky voice singing, never failed me yet. Did you hear it? Never failed me yet. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. There's one thing I know, for he loved me so. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. The man who originally recorded it did it in 1975, and he was doing research there in the slums of London. And this man was not even a drinker. He was a man of God, poor and dirty and toothless, hungry and ragged, shining for Jesus in the darkest places of the world. Because of my values, my own socialization, I need help to appreciate people who are down in others. James says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? So I got thinking, the individual calls of Jesus in the New Testament, man, what a, what a, Embarrassing church would be if you put them all together. Peter, a fisherman, who wasn't fishing because he was traveling around with Jesus, he, anytime he wasn't near the Sea of Galilee, he wasn't fishing. He was so poor that he couldn't pay the temple tax of 12 cents. Remember that? They asked Peter if, he, if Jesus paid the temple tax, and Peter said yes, and and then he went and told Jesus, and Jesus didn't have the money. Peter didn't have the money. Jesus told Peter to go fishing, and then he caught a fish, and he said, you'll find a coin in his mouth, and that'll be a quarter, and that'll pay for both of us. So you got this economically poor man, although he's a good man, an honest, hard-working man. Then there was Zacchaeus. He was deformed. He was a dwarf. He was a publican, hated, an outcast, up in a tree. Jesus called him, come down, come to me. And Zacchaeus came. There was Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. Don't, don't leave out the beggar part. Dirty, ragged. He heard that Jesus was coming by. And he called out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody said, be quiet. Jesus called him. There were a lot of nicer people in the crowd. There were Pharisees and priests and religious people in that crowd, but he calls this blind beggar. He chose him. Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? There was Mary Magdalene. You see pictures of Mary Magdalene. She's always so beautiful, wearing a white and blue robe. Look, that woman was a mess. I think in the village, I'm making this up, but if it was here, they, they'd been calling her Crazy Mary. Seven demons. She was crazy. Wild. Jesus set her free and calmed her. He chose her. There's the demoniac of Gadara running around naked, cutting himself with stones and screaming all night in terror to the neighborhoods around. Jesus called him, made him new, delivered him from the powers of darkness, put them together. What, what a church! Uh, what a church! I don't have.
have any statistics to prove this, but I, I'm guessing pro possibly the percentage of salvageable people among the world's outcasts is higher than among the more cultured and well-to-do people. God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of his salvation. And Jesus said, how, hardly it, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. If you really fulfill the royal law, said James, if you really fulfill the royal law according to scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. So who's my neighbor? Are those Bowery bums my neighbors? Are the winos and the drug addicts my neighbors? From the parable of the Good Samaritan, we take this lesson. Whoever God puts in your path who has a need that you can meet is your neighbor. So, as I was reading this scripture and it spoke to me how I have been a disappointment to God with my revulsion at people who seem to be very low, I pray that with God's help to have a heart that doesn't judge first. The judgment will be there because it's just part of my genetic structure, I think. But he said, not that there won't be, I won't make the error of misjudging people, but that the mercy will triumph over that judgment. Because God has been so merciful to you and to me. We pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And here, if we judge, we will be judged. If we are merciful, triumph. Our mercy will triumph over judgment. I want, with God's help, to see more clearly that the Church of Jesus Christ is not something we're trying to polish up and to make a good impression before the world. But we are a light in a dark place. And the per people who are the poorest and the most bound up of dominating sin, they need the light the most. They need to be the ones we're bringing to Christ. Remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus is another one wouldn't be very pretty to have in church. He was in rags. He was so poor he sat down under the table and picked up the crumbs that rich men dropped. So ugly that dogs licked his sores. Yet he's the one. He's the one that God chose and God called and received God's love and salvation. Rich in faith, an heir to God's kingdom. The truth about us is that it doesn't matter how well educated or spiritual we are. It has nothing to do with our social standing. The nicest, prettiest Christian in the world. His righteousness is like filthy rags. Can't get any worse than that. So we're really not above and below at all. We're only imaginary, uh, imagining that uh, some people are more valuable than others because they're more civilized, more acceptable, more polite, easier to accept. We are not morally superior to homeless ones. God's mercy abounds toward us 
and it triumphs over judgment within us. Every living person is important to God. I was reading about Mother Teresa. I wish she'd been a Baptist, you know. <laughs> she loved Jesus. She took people in India, I think they were Hindus. I think that's the big religion there. They were Christians. Dug them, they'd find them in ditches. And her nuns would help them, carry them in to a place to find a bed and feed them and clean them and kiss them on the forehead. And well, I don't know, she never said hundreds of them turned to Jesus for it. She never mentioned that at all. Only inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. God give me that kind of heart. Every living person of every religion, of every race, every nation, every color, is important to God. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. On the judgment day, Jesus, Jesus told this parable about the end of the world. It says, the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I want to hear that. Come ye blessed of my Father. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. God grant me, God grant all of us a heart in which mercy 